Bob, and it is a pleasure to be back here in Vancouver for um, the, the second iteration of this meeting, and it's also a pleasure to follow um, Ambassador Goosby, and he set the stage for my talk beautifully when he talked about the importance of the science and the importance of answering the critical questions, but at the same time being able to move forward um, with implementation, knowing full well that as we get additional answers that we will need to um, adjust and modify. And I really appreciate his remark about not feeling paralyzed. So I think it's important that we think about um, HIV prevention and think about it in terms of some guiding principles. And um, Eric alluded to some of this in terms of um, there's a fundamental assumption that was the basis of his talk that is combination prevention is the way forward. And that is because no single prevention strategy is sufficient to control um, the HIV epidemic. The other key piece in all of this is that HIV testing is the essential entry point for all of prevention, individually focused prevention interventions. You need to know if you're dealing with an HIV positive person who is then eligible to be um, ratcheted into care and then into treatment, or an HIV negative person at risk and then eligible for other prevention services. As we are here at this meeting to focus, HIV treatment is a critical component of the full prevention landscape. But ultimately, another, it's like, you know, it's great to follow Eric. He says all the right things and it just is a natural lead in, is that there is no such thing as a single epidemic. And within your community, you have to understand the epidemics and select the right prevention interventions based upon the effectiveness of those individual prevention strategies plus their cost. And then as they take hold, and as you have an impact on your epidemic, continue to track your, the epidemic in your communities um, and adjust accordingly by adjusting your prevention strategies. So if we think about the, the range of opportunities, um, I was asked to then focus in on treatment as prevention as um, the key variable, because that is the focus of this meeting. And as a, and I'd like to come back to this paper because in some ways it really did lay out a, a research agenda for um, treatment as prevention. And this was an article that Tony and I wrote and published um, a little less than three years ago. And it basically was at the time based mainly on the mathematical models. But there were a number of assumptions that could be tested and validated through research. So we came up with this list of fairly significant research issues that needed to be dealt with in order to really truly understand the impact of treatment as prevention. And I'm going to just highlight a couple of these um, in light of, of progress and uh, as the research agenda has matured. This remains our biggest challenge. Um, and this represents the, um, the cascade effect as it, it currently plays out in the United States, where out of every 100 people that are HIV infected, um, approximately 26 end up fully suppressed with, um, uh, on treatment. Now, uh, talking to colleagues recently from Great Britain, that number is actually closer to 51 percent of the, uh, so depending on the healthcare system, there are opportunities to just ratchet this up. And so I think that um, as we go forward, it's not just that there's a universal solution to this, but the healthcare system itself needs to play a major role in this. And as we look forward to seeing what happens with the Affordable Care Act, we're hopeful that at least within the United States, uh, the Affordable Care Act can have a major impact on uh, th this middle section of the agenda, particularly in light of uh, in, in this area here with linkage to care through the home health care model. As we think about this, we do need to significantly improve um, the, the, the testing component as well as the linkage to care. As we look at the, some of the data in different approaches uh, from studies that are still ongoing, such as HPTN 053, um, 043, um, it, was, it looked at two, two approaches to, um, uh, to testing in, in sites in uh, Tanzania, Zimbabwe, and Thailand. You can see that um, community-based VCT was significantly better um, in all cases to a point where it increased the testing tenfold in Zimbabwe and nearly tripled it um, in Thailand. Now this doesn't approach the level we need to get to, but through expansion of community-based testing as one example, we can continue to improve this component of the cascade. Um, we await the results of HPTN 043, which will look at the impact of testing and community-based interventions on the overall incidence in communities. This is, remains an ongoing trial, but this part of their data is now publicly available. Now, 
one of the reasons we are here today is to is we do know there is efficacy of ART in preventing transmission. Just to remind everybody, uh, for the study design of HBTN052, it was immediate therapy for individuals identified with a CD4 count between 350 and 550, or deferred, and there was randomization to uh, people who delayed the initiation of heart to below uh, 250 CD4 cells. And as this is a slide we'll probably see a fair amount of at this meeting, is that the paper was published um, in August. Um, there were presentations at Rome last year, and it, it, in some ways the meeting uh, was a week early, uh, a year ago. And it was the breakthrough of the year, as you have heard. Um, but I think it's important to focus on what HPTN052 truly did, is it didn't test the impact of treatment. It tested the impact of reaching and achieving full virologic suppression. And I think there's a difference, and I think we need to focus on that, is the goal of treatment should be not dispensing pills, but it needs to stay the, um, the, the developing and sustaining full virologic suppression in the treated individual. So that's why that's highlighted. Let's talk about the benefit to the individual, because this remains um, somewhat of a hot button issue. And there are trials that have been completed and trials that are ongoing that uh, address this. The first of which was the cipra Haiti trial, which demonstrated at the very low CD4 count, um, there was benefit to early treatment. Um, within, what is the additional evidence for clinical benefit of early treatment? Well, this is a one that some of you may have missed, because the SHARE study was the pediatric trial. And what that, that trial had shown all along is that there was clinical benefit to the individual starting early, but we didn't really have, starting essentially within six weeks of birth. But we didn't realize how profound that, um, that benefit was until we went back and compared just a delay of six months to eight months. And the fact is, is that if you delay the treatment, even that short amount of time, the neurological benefit of early treatment to that infant is lost. So, you know, take this and extrapolate to the adults. We have no idea what the damage is to the brain in that very short period of time or that long period of time between initial infection and diagnosis. This remains an issue that we will need to grapple with. Now, on the slide, I've, I've added the data related to tuberculosis that was published in the 052 paper, but um, uh, HPTN 052 team um, is busy completing the analysis of all clinical events to date by treatment arm, and this will give us maybe some level one evidence of the, the benefit of early treatment at some point over the summer. It's important to keep in mind that HPTN 052 is an ongoing study. We're looking at questions about durability, uptake, and um, we look forward to um, several more years of publications um, and important data coming out of HBTN 052. The other study that matters um, right now is the PROMISE study, and that's a, um, a, a trial that we're essentially evaluating B plus um, and other pediatric options. And as this rolls out, as a community, we will need to grapple with do we really need to complete that study, or does it, at some point, due to the rollout, are we offering substandard level of care to the women who are enrolled in the control arms? So that's a debate that is active and ongoing at the NIH, and we're going to have an ethical consultation around the future of, of PROMISE. At the same time, we have the START protocol. Uh, this is an ongoing uh, trial within um, a number of countries. Uh, and it looks at the uh, starting therapy early at a CD4 count greater than 500, capturing all clinical events, and then the deferred group doesn't start until a CD4 count of 350. And as the data continues to accumulate, in some ways we have to sit back and think about this trial as well and start considering a, a set of questions related to, are, are, is there evidence that could come from START? that would somehow provide data that starting early wasn't of benefit. And so maybe it's time to flip the paradigm on its head. I think it's a conversation we need to have and will continue to have as the data accumulates. And so we eagerly anticipate the data from 052 and we'll, we'll see how um, it plays out with the ongoing START trial. Uh, START is headed to its first interim DSMB um, over the next four months and uh, we'll see what happens with that. 
In terms of the other areas along the treatment cascade, um, the NIH has sponsored an RFA this year that really looked at um, ways of linking uh, in a rapid way uh, individuals to care after HIV diagnosis to really try to improve retention in the first year of primary care to really work toward a timely initiation of ART. Um, uh, and this, AR, this um, uh, RFA generated a large amount of interest um, and uh, is really uh, an area of active research among the, our, the three lead institutes, the National Institutes of Mental Health, uh, the National Institute of, of Drug Abuse, and uh, Dr. Volkoff is here, and the NIAID. So we look forward to the results from these grants that will be funded from this RFA. So one of the areas that um, we've been working with PEPFAR on is can we take the data that we have generated, fully acknowledging the cascade, and truly through um, effectiveness studies, um, work with OGAC and NIH to partner to see if we could um, truly evaluate the effectiveness of combination prevention interventions within a global epidemic. Um, and this was a, an RFA that we put out um, about a year ago, and we funded a, a group led by Richard Hayes, um, at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, um, and it's called POPART, or HPTN 071. I think it's worth spending a moment to talk about the structure of this so you can see what is being considered within this trial design. Uh, the, 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 the geographical um, regions where we're going to perform the study are in Zambia and the Western Cape. Um, the populations that will be covered by the targeted interventions will be uh, approximately 1.2 million people in 24 clusters um, with, I with interventions in 16 of the 24 clusters, uh, uh, and each cluster is approximately 800,000 people. And so it's important just to focus a moment on the three arms that we're considering as we roll this trial forward. Uh, one is immediate ART, uh, analogous to HBTN 052. Uh, one is an enhanced standard of care with CD4 count, um, the 350 level, and then it's the uh, this is the standard of care that is currently existing within country. So this is a, a trial that we're in the process of getting ready to initiate, but it will really compare these three arms, run for several years, um, and I, as Eric says, it'll help us answer the question while implementing um, uh, the process, and this is another an example of uh, the activities that uh, we're going to provide. We'll provide counseling, condom provision, um, syndromic treatment of sexually transmitted infections, um, a good referral for uh, pregnancy and PMTCT, and house-to-house -house testing. Now, I'd like to close um, by giving you sort of my optimistic long-range vision of where I think we're headed. And I think it's important to bring back into this um, conversation a little bit um, microbicides and pre-exposure prophylaxis, because I do believe that uh, there will be a niche um, for these uh, prevention interventions, particularly with longer acting formulations of ART and the newer gels and rings that are being developed. But I think the, the, the longer acting formulations, the slow release and long acting formulations for ARTs, such as TMC278LA and the GSK integrase inhibitors, will be important not just for treatment, not just for prevention, but also for treatment. And you can get to a situation where the therapeutic armamentarium contained a regimen that required only four to 12 doses a year. That could be another game changer in terms of the adherence um, and ease of delivery uh, that we can achieve. With those kinds of drugs, we could also reduce pre-exposure prophylaxis to four to 12 doses a year. And with these tools, we could truly begin to control the, the pandemic. So with that, I'll stop. Um, and just remind everybody that our common goal is to control and ultimately end the HIV pandemic. Thank you for your attention.